Hello, this is Rick Crawford, welcoming you back to another episode of Digging into San Diego History. And you can tell from our title screen here, we're going to talk about water today. And this is a, a fascinating subject for San Diego history. I'm going to show you a lot of photographs here, and uh, we'll discuss it as we go through our history. So let's get started. So we're looking first at our first civil engineering water project in California. This is the Mission Dam, or Padre Dam, as it's sometimes called, 1932 in this photograph. But it was built in the early 1800s uh, by the Europeans, by the missionaries that founded the San Diego Mission. The first mission was actually uh, on Presidio Hill, not too far from today's Sarah Museum. It was moved upstream just a short time later to take advantage of the better water supply being closer to the river. And they built this diverting dam, which directed water into an aqueduct, which went about four or five miles downstream toward the mission lands where they, they did their agriculture. This was quite well constructed. We had uh, a rebel base with thin tile over it, and mostly Native American labor went into this, we can assume, but it was extremely well done. Here's a look at the modern dam for as it is looks today, well preserved today. So we'll jump ahead a few decades here. This is San Diego around 1870 and the city population had grown very very slowly. In the 1850 census, which is the year of statehood for California, just a short time after the gold rush began, we had 650 people in the city of San Diego, town of San Diego, and about 700 plus in the county. That grew very slowly. In 1870, we were up to 731 people in San Diego. And one of the limiting factors was we had very poor transportation to San Diego. We're on the corner of the United States with no rail transportation. Most people are going to San Francisco before they come to San Diego. But a limiting factor in any growth was water supply. It had been difficult for uh, the Padres in the mission period. It was even more difficult for uh, Europeans as they grew San Diego. This is an interesting article from the San Diego Union in June 1873, and it describes how water was supplied in that early period. We actually had a monopoly in town. This is the city water company that had a deep well uh, in San Diego down in San Diego proper and uh, down near Front Street. This well was about eight feet in diameter and went down about 40 feet. And they pumped the water up, pumped that up into tanks. And then from these big tanks, they would load water into barrels, which would go on to wagons and be delivering and would deliver to people. And most people bought their water by the bucket. This was kind of like your later day milkman coming. So the water truck would come by and sell you water. And the rate typically at this time was about 35 buckets of water for $1. So let's jump now to the mid 1880s and we're looking at Boomtown San Diego. This is Fifth Street. Fifth Street was equivalent to our later Broadway. And what happened was in the mid 80s, we finally got a railroad to uh, Southern California. It went first to Los Angeles, then we got a spur line to San Diego, and suddenly everything took off. The population just boomed. We went from just 2,600 people in San Diego in 1880 to 30,000 30, people by 1887 or 88. We, we grew our population three or four times in just 18 months. So suddenly the water needs uh, are quite urgent, and we need to do something about this pretty quickly. So what they began in 1886 was a aqueduct from the Cuyamacas. And this was a project from Ed Fletcher, who would become very prominent in water circles for a long time in San Diego. Uh, Cuyamaca Lake, which still exists today, of course, uh, was the, uh, the reservoir that fed this aqueduct that went downhill 37 miles. This is a redwood aqueduct. Here you're looking at some men uh, putting the floorboards into this. And this is a dramatic example of what they did. This is the La Coches trestle as it looked 1925. This was quite a bit later in its history, but this is a redwood 
Chaussel, and uh, went all the way down to, well, kind of the area of La Mesa today. From there, it would feed uh, pipelines and get it directed into San Diego. Here's a fun picture of dedication day for the flume in February 1889. And we have the state governors seated on the right. That's Governor Waterman over there. And we had other dignitaries that were on little boats. They're about to take a ride down, down the flume. So that covered San Diego pretty well for a short period of time, but in the South Bay they were doing something different and they built our first major dam in San Diego. And it was quite an attraction for people. This is a brochure or a, or a flyer that uh, promotes the dam and gets people down there almost as tourists to see this, this marvel that they just created. Here's Sweetwater Dam at flood stage in January 1895, and this was a lot more water than they designed the dam for. It's going over the top of the dam, which is what you don't normally want. It can destroy a dam, and we're going to see examples of that happening later on. But uh, this dam would be raised several times. When it was finished in 1888, the dam was uh, only 90 feet tall and they've raised it several times after that and they've rebuilt the spillways on either side so it, it's a bit different different dam today quite a bit taller so the city of san diego was going to try to build their own dam now sweetwater dam had been built by south bay national city interest city of san diego began in 1897 to build marina this is about 60 60 miles uh, due east of San Diego as the bird flies. And this is on the Cottonwood Creek where they built this dam. And frankly, it was kind of an amateur project to begin with. They had a little bit of civil engineering expertise, uh, not enough, it was difficult. What they're doing here is they are using derricks to bring heavy rubble from the hillside on either side of the dam. You're looking at what's called a tow dam right here in the middle. They would build this down from or up from the foundation of the dam to up from bedrock. Rubble, big boulders would uh, be dropped on either side and masonry concrete filled in. And that's how they would build the dam. The first dam leaked a lot. It was quite a problem for people. And eventually they ran out of money and stopped. So the dam was not fully functional for several more years. But in the meantime, they had a good time building it. Uh, this is a visit by the city council in 97. It was quite a tourist attraction. People like to come up and see the construction as it was going. Uh, eventually, they, they got the dam really fixed well by M.M. O'Shaughnessy, who was a professional civil engineer. O'Shaughnessy spent three years on the dam in the early 1900s getting it into good shape. Uh, O'Shaughnessy would go on to build uh, the rather notorious Hetch Hetchy Dam, which drowned part of Yosemite, but he's probably better known for that. Here's uh, some additions to Moraine Dam in 1923. It would get quite a few changes and additions in future years. This is how it looked in the 1920s. Uh, not our most attractive dam, but it's, uh, you see a spillway here over on the left and that would become an important factor in this dam. Here's how it looks in modern times. This is a picture that I took a few years ago that really shows how it looks today. You can even see up on the hillside in the background, you can see some kind of scarring. Uh, they blew up a lot of the hillside just to provide the rubble for the dam. That's how they would do it in those days. Marina Dam was designed to send water downstream well, they had to send water downstream to do its job, of course. And so this is the conduit or aqueduct that they were building on Cottonwood Creek below Morena. This would go downstream west and eventually it would get as far as uh, Otay Lake, which was much closer to San Diego. It's another picture of the Dilzura conduit, as it was called. So let's meet this man. This is Charles M. Hatfield, the rainmaker. So we're in 1915. Mr. Hatfield has made quite a living, prosperous living, 
making rain in various parts of the country. He had contracts as far away as Honduras or north as far as the Yukon and everywhere in between. He was in Texas, did a lot of work in the Central Valley. He was a sewing machine salesman originally, and apparently he was quite a successful salesman because he had a lot of jobs. He showed up in San Diego in December 1915. We hadn't had a lot of water in recent years. We were not exactly in drought, but they were very interested because this man had a track record and he promised he would fill Morena Lake, Morena Reservoir for $10,000. And he received what he thought was a verbal contract. And so he went to work uh, with his brother building his tower which we'll describe in a minute here. This is a picture, studio picture apparently, of Hatfield at work with a lot of his chemicals which he used to induce rain. What he would do is he would build these little towers. And this is a picture of him at work in Hemet, California on another, another project. The towers weren't very tall as you can see, but he would go up into one of these and he would have a vat of chemicals which he would ignite and smoke would waft into the air and into the clouds and apparently precipitate rain. So January 1916, Hatfield is up in Morena and we have a witness. This is Shelley Higgins, who was the deputy city attorney at that time. He was out in that area to check up on Hatfield and interesting quote from him. I was startled by a sudden view of what looked like an oil tower on the heights above Marina Basin. In the sky appeared puffs of smoke and I heard explosions. It was Hatfield shooting bombs, exploding them in an incantation aimed at ringing moisture from the air. And here's one of many newspaper articles that's questioning, was it Hatfield? Was it something else? And the rain certainly did begin to fall. Uh, we had a big storm on January 10th and it flooded in a short period of time, many parts of the county. This is Morena, totally full in January, 1916. This is a picture taken apparently by Paul Hatfield, Hatfield's younger brother who was on the scene. And this is what it did to Mission Valley. We've had two or three occasions in the 1900s when Mission Valley would flood like this from one side to the other, but this is in January, it's in 1916. This is what it did to a railroad yard. This is some of the damage in the South Bay area. This is Sweetwater Dam again. Now this is one of the first dams, as you recall, that was built in San Diego, it actually was the first major dam. And this is what it did to the spillway that you can see here on the left. Dams are not designed to be overtopped. Uh, this dam was overtopped by water in 1895, which we showed you in an earlier photograph. They're supposed to go through the spillway, which is a much safer way to do it. But they didn't know how to build spillways to accommodate floods, such as what we had at that time. So it, it wiped out the, the abutment on the left there, the spillway. But that would be repaired and the dam itself was would, would remain intact. But this is what it did at the lower Otai Dam. Remember, Morena is saying it's water downstream through the Dozera Conduit all the way down to Otai. And what you can see here, if you look closely, right here on the side, this is the remains of the dam. The dam is totally gone. What you're looking at here is the iron core of the dam, they would build the dams at that time uh, with an iron core in the middle, would go up vertical, and rubble would surround that on either side, and that was a common way to build a dam. And here you see that that the rubble is all gone, all washed away, but you have just the iron core, it's just, or steel core actually, just peeled, peeled back from the floodwaters. There was a piece of that iron core that's washed miles downstream. So here's a look at the design of the dam system here. We have up here on the extreme left here, you have Morena Dam. It's flowing west to, to Barrett, which would be built after the Hatfield flood. But then it's gonna go all the way downstream 
to lower Oetai down here, and then you can see how it goes into various directions after that. So let's meet Hiram Savage, who is the city hydraulic engineer. This man is very important in water history. This was, he was a trained civil engineer, did a lot of work with the U.S. Reclamation Service. He inspected projects in foreign countries, was extremely knowledgeable, and very well respected as an engineer. So Savage was hired to do a lot of different projects for San Diego. His first project was to rebuild Lower Oatai Dam, which had been totally destroyed by the Hatfield flood, the Rainmaker flood. So he went to work on that shortly after uh, the, the flood. This is a group of men on the work scene at Lower Oatai. Here we see a what's called a big shot when they would use dynamite just to blow up the side of the hillside. And this is again how they would produce the rubble uh, that would build, build the dams. Down here, you can actually see how close they were to the lower Otai original again. Here's a picture of the, uh, the iron core that's been folded back by the, by the flood. As soon as Lower Otai was done, they moved upstream to the site for Barrett Dam. Barrett would be between Morena and Lower Otai. So here's some men beginning work with a concrete pour at Barrett. And here's another shot of uh, concrete being dumped into the foundation of the dam. Here's Mr. Hiram Savage supervising. He was at work sites all the time. I don't recall any photographs when he doesn't appear dressed so well with his hat and coat and tie. Here's a picture of Lower Otai back in February 1918 and uh, the recreation hall at Otai. All these sites had uh, big construction camps because people were living there at the site as they built the dam. You didn't get up in the morning and get in your pickup and drive the, the work site. You'd live there. And so they had a construction hall. They would actually have schools. They had a commissary, everything that would go with making it actually a small town. And here's Lower Oitai Dam as it was completed uh, in September 1919. So, so back to Barrett again. This is the original Barrett Dam, which was just a, almost a test dam. This is in 1898. And this would be the site of the, of the big dam they were about to build. Big shot, blowing down rubble that they would use for the dam. And these are the called the quarrymen at Barrett that would collect all this rubble and bring it to the site construction trucks at the site of the Barrett Dam. And here the dam, you're beginning to see it raise quite a bit up. We've got the whole dam front right here, downstream side of the dam. And this is kind of unusual for a dam site. You've got the water quite high. That's not what they wanted, of course, but they were unlucky with the seasons as they were putting the dam together. You're getting closer finishing it. Back here in the background, you can see really the construction camp barely on the hillside there. Again, water very close to the top of the dam. Here is a schoolhouse. They actually had schoolhouses for the kids. This is Mrs. Myrtle Duck and her students at the Barrett Construction Camp. Mrs. Duck would later uh, her husband was deceased when she married a man named Mr. Finney, and she would become a prominent teacher and principal in the South Bay. There is a Finney Elementary School today. And here's Dedication Day at Barrett Dam, July 25th, 1922. Another excellent shot of the Barrett Dam. So let's step away from dam building for just a minute and talk about another important factor in the water system, and that's the pipelines between the dams. And this is actually redwood pipe 
that was considered, frankly, state-of-the-art at the time. This is a redwood pipe that's not doing so well, obviously. That's the liability of using wood, but this was a common method of doing it. So in 1900, we're building pipelines from Lower Oatai towards San Diego. And so here's some men at work on a long stretch. You can see you've got these iron rings wrapped around the wooden staves that formed that, that long barrel. Here's a picture of them building pipeline near Choyas Lake. Uh, water is coming north from Otai towards San Diego and would actually go into the little lake at Choyas, which still exists today. So they're headed that direction. From Choyas, they would be sent by more pipeline into San Diego. Here it is, water being dumped into Choyas from that redwood pipe. So this is an interesting picture of the University Heights filtration plant and water would come here from Choyas and other sources. The water would go into these big redwood, redwood tubs filled with sand and this is the filtration technique they used. And from there the water would go into an aeration table and then it would get pumped into a large, large reservoir for the site and from that reservoir water would be sent uh, downstream, so to speak, to different parts of the city, and usually uh, the water pressure was provided just by, by the gravity flow. But this filtration plant existed and was used uh, heavily up until the time the Alvarado filtration plant was completed at Lake Murray in 1950. So let's meet another significant water man. This is John Eastwood, who built several dams in California, including a couple in San Diego that we're going to look at here. We're going to talk about the Lake Murray Dam in a minute here that was built by John Eastwood, but here's the old La Mesa Dam that was built in 1895. This was actually a dirt-filled dam that was built uh, before the turn of the century, and we have a photograph courtesy of Phil Pride, who is a, a geography professor from San Diego State. This picture was taken when Lake Murray was quite low from, for some work that was being done. And here's a picture of the Murray Dam going up. This is the uh, upstream side of the dam. And you can see the very unique uh, curvature of, of the construction here. And here we are looking at uh, the completed Murray Dam. And you're looking upstream at the dam with uh, the characteristic features of an Eastwood Dam. Uh, Lake Hodges Dam was an Eastwood Dam that you'll see in just a minute. Looks very similar. Right here, here's Hodges Dam in 1927, and this was completed in 1918. Here is Hodges overflowing in February 1937. We had a big water year in 37, and this is what uh, has occasionally occurred at Lake Hodges. Here is a newspaper heading headlines from February 37 talking about the huge record rain that they had in San Diego. And it actually shows a photograph down here of, of Hodges, and this is Mission Valley up here. There is Mission Valley again. As I mentioned earlier on, you've had two or three occasions. This is the second occasion. I think it also happened in 37, but in 1927, this is a picture of Mission Valley flooded from one side to another. Now we're going to go to an interesting dam in North County. This is a Sutherland Dam, and they began working on this in 1928, and they had some difficulties. First of all, they began building the dam kind of on the wrong site. Once they got going, they looked at the, uh, the bedrock and decided they were in earthquake areas there, and they stopped the whole project and moved it upstream for several hundred yards. Of course, that was extremely expensive and time consuming, and that bad luck would just continue. The work went on for another year or two, and then it just flat ran out of money, and the city decided that they would just stop, and then the project would be totally abandoned for many years. This is in the uh, late 20s when they were working on the dam. They would not get back to it for quite a long time. So here we are back at Sutherland, 1952. We finally begun work on the dam again. And here they are dumping concrete into the work site. 
finally completed 1953. Here is the, uh, the dedication day. And the completed Sutherland Dam. So here's an interesting, uh, almost a fiasco for San Diego. We would think of it as a fiasco today. This is Mission Gorge, where they planned to build a dam in the 1920s. Remember Hiram Savage, the city hydraulic engineer in the teens and 20s. Uh, very important guy, very capable engineer. And he looked at Mission Gorge and thought, well, this is just perfect for a dam site because you've got these narrow canyon areas. You've got good granites. You can build a big, heavy uh, gravity dam that would block it and you would have a monstrous reservoir behind it. So this was their plan for Mission Gorge. This is actually just a few miles from the Padre Dam that we showed you earlier on at the beginning of this program. Well, fortunately, uh, the voters got it right. There were two elections, two bond elections that would finance uh, the dam and that would go into Mission Gorge and it failed. Uh, they tried twice to get this passed. It just did not go anywhere. And uh, we moved on to a different project. And what was decided they would do instead, their alternate site for a big dam would be El Capitan, which would have to be a different kind of dam, but it was doable. And Savage, you know, swallowed his pride and says, well, I'll build it at El Capitan if I can't do Mission Gorge. So this is when Groundbreaking has taken place. We've got some men on the way to the work site in December 1931. Now, this is a very much different kind of dam that we're used to. Gravity dams are the big masonry dams, the big concrete uh, dams. Uh, this is an earth filled dam. They did not have the bedrock in this area to build a gravity dam, so they're going to build it out of rock fill. And uh, this is a water being. Uh, you know, dousing the, the work site to settle the, the silt. And you can see up here uh, a truck dumping dirt for the dam. You've got water course being fired from down below. And you had a monstrous spillaway. They'd finally learned their lessons. You have to build big spillaways for dams. So when you do have a flood, it doesn't overtop the dam itself, which will damage the dam. You have to have a go down spillway. So we have a big concrete spillway. You've got the dam itself over here, of course, but the spillway over here is on the left of the dam and that would direct any kind of floodwaters. Here's dedication of the big dam at El Capitan in 1935. And you're looking at the spillway in the foreground here and then the big dam over here. If you're visiting El Capitan, here's the road that you would follow to go into, into the lake. And here's a very murky picture. I took this myself in 2006. Obviously not a great day for picture taking, uh, but this shows you the upstream side of the dam. So now we're going to go look at uh, one of the last big dam projects that we'll talk about here today. This is building of San Vicente in 1942. And things were getting kind of desperate at this time in San Diego because the city grew enormously from World War II and the war, of course, is an early stage here in 42. But we already know that we're going to have to have a very greatly enhanced water supply. And uh, San Vicente is, is one quick solution that they think they can do. And much of the dam building here is financed uh, actually by the military. The Navy was a big part of the construction financing for San Vicente. This, by the way, is a concrete bucket that has eight yards of concrete in it. And this would be lower to the site and then they would kick some kind of lever down here and it would dump down below. This is, if you've seen pictures of, of Hoover Dam, Boulder Dam being built, you will see these big buckets uh, dumping concrete that way. And here the dam is starting to go up from, from the bedrock. And again, a big concrete pour going. Uh, the concrete is always poured in layers. And uh, one layer will be done, more will be dumped in an the other area, and it will just be built up slowly, step by step. 
it shows you an example of the different levels that are going up. And one thing interesting feature of this dam was, in the construction anyway, is you had actually a roadway right through the middle of the dam. And this was an existing road that they maintained almost till the very end. And, uh, and then it was finally sealed up. Here's another view of the dam going up. Uh, and there's that unique road right in the middle of it still. Here we have a dedication picture. The dam had already been completed. It was, the dam was built between 41 and 43, but here we have some dignitaries taking a tour of the dam in 47. This was after the, uh, the aqueduct from Northern California was completed to San Vicente, and you'll see that in just a minute. But I think it's interesting that they, the Navy uh, was a big provider of funds for the San Vicente Dam, and here they are using a Navy landing craft looks like a Higgins boat from D-Day you know that they're using to to tour the site and here's a, a view of San Vicente completed as it looked in 1950 and the start of San Diego aqueduct or the aqueduct that came from Northern California this is being bringing what they call the first barrel later they would add more but this is the first run of the water from Northern California that would end up at San Vicente Another picture of big concrete barrels uh, going through the land. And here it is at San Vicente. This is a tunnel above San Vicente, bringing Northern California water to the reservoir. Here's one last look at San Vicente uh, as it looks today. We actually went back to Vicente in 2009 to begin a big raise. They raised the dam 117 feet. And that, of course, created a much, much larger reservoir behind it. And uh, the whole height of the dam now is 387 feet, or I'm sorry, 337 feet. And uh, this was completed, the dam raise was completed in 2014. It took about five years to do it. So let's finish today with a quick look of uh, the water map. And many of the reservoirs that we built are shown in this map. Uh, you'll see here Moreno over here that flows down to Barrett and then down to Lower Otai. We have Choyas up here and Sweetwater right there. Up here we've got uh, Sutherland and San Vicente and Lake Murray and Hodges over here. So this is the water system that has served San Diego uh, for well over a century in some cases. And I hope that gives you some information that uh, maybe you didn't know before. So thank you very much. I would suggest if you'd like to know more about our water history, uh, come to the library, of course. We've got a lot of materials to show you, including a lot of photographs. Many of the pictures that you saw today came from a water project that we did with the uh, Water Utilities Department. We had a lot of records uh, archived and photographs digitized, and much of that material you can look at here at the library. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.